Welcome to our worship today. It is Sunday, September 27th, 2020, the 17th Sunday after Pentecost, and we are glad you're here. Our world is now blessed by lots of rain, even though smoldering fire is still around us. And we give thanks that in the midst of, of gathering in, together in worship, we also still share through the airways. So we be in, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and recognize our sinfulness as we come to our Lord and Savior. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Gracious God, have mercy upon us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves over to the power of sin. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, the things we have done and the things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your Holy Spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead to sin and brought us alive through Christ Jesus. Our sins have been forgiven, and we lift up our hearts in joy as we go about his task. Thanks be to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that we walk in newness of life. Be at peace. Amen. The Old Testament lesson this morning comes from Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 1 through 4, and 25 to 32. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you mean by repeating the proverb? The parents have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, says the Lord God, this proverb shall be no more used in Israel. Know that all lives are mine. The life of the parent as well as the life of the child is mine. It is only the person who sins that shall die. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is unfair. Listen to me, O house of Israel. I, the one who is unjust, or is it you? When righteous people turn from being good and start doing sinful things, they will die for it. Yes, they will die because of their sins. And if wicked people turn away from their wickedness, obey the law, and do what is right, they will save their lives. They will live because after thinking it over, they decided to turn from their sins. Such people will not die. And yet the people of Israel keep saying, the Lord is unjust. People of Israel, it is you who are unjust, not I. Therefore, I will judge you. O house of Israel, all of you, according to your transgressions, turn away from your sins. Do not let them destroy you. Put your rebellion behind you and get for yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why should you die? I don't want you to die, says the Lord God. Turn back and live. The epistle lesson this morning comes from Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4 and 14 through 16. Is there any encouragement in Christ? Any consolation from love? Any sharing in the Spirit? Any compassion and sympathy? Then make, joy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, the same love, in full according to one another. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but humbly regard others better than yourselves. Let each of you not look to your own interests, but the interest of others. Do all things without murmuring and arguing, so that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, in which you shine like stars in the world. It is by holding fast to the word of life that I can boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. This ends the reading. 
The gospel for this, the 17th Sunday after Pentecost, is taken from Matthew chapter 21, starting at the 23rd verse. Jesus encounters some opposition against the leaders in the temple. When Jesus returned to the temple to teach, the chief priests and the elders came up to him, demanding, by whose authority did you drive out the merchants from the temple? I'll tell you who gave me the authority to do these things. If you answer a question for me, he answered. Did John the, John's baptism come from heaven, or was it merely human? They talked it over among themselves. If we say it was from heaven, he'll ask us why we didn't believe him. But if we say it was merely human, we'll be mobbed by the people because they think John was a prophet. So they replied, we don't know. Jesus said, then I won't answer your question either. But what do you think about this? A certain man had two sons and told the older boy, son, go out to work in the vineyard today. The son answered, no, I won't, but later changed his mind and went anyway. The father then told the other son, you go. And he said, yes, I will, but he didn't go. Now, which of the two was obeying the father? They answered, well, the first, of course. Then Jesus explained the meaning. I assure you, corrupt tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you do. For John the Baptist came and showed you the way to life, and you didn't believe him, while the tax collectors and prostitutes did. And even when you saw all this happening, you still refused to turn from your sins and believe him. This is the gospel of our Lord. Let us pray. Thus says the Lord through his prophet, as the snow and the rain come down from heaven and would water the earth, making it break forth and sprout, bringing seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but shall accomplish that for which I have sent it and succeed in the purposes I have directed. O oh Lord, let this so happen today through your servant. Amen. I quit. You ever said those words? Legendary football coach Vince Lombardi is quoted as saying, winners never quit and quitters never win, which are inspiring words, sure, but they're not necessarily true. Extraordinary benefits come to those rare few who do push themselves a little bit longer and harder than those around them. But extraordinary benefits also accrue to those who quit early and refocus on something new and better. Quitting as a short-term reaction to some difficulty in life is, is often a bad idea. But quitting for the long term can not only be an excellent idea, it can be a real possibility opener, both for you and maybe even the world. Bob Goff says he quits something every single Thursday, and he's been at that for six years, and he still finds things to quit. I'd go so far as to say that, that the biggest names in the Bible were quitters, too. Jesus' disciples, they quit their jobs, fishing, tax collecting, zealoting to follow him. Paul quit breathing threats and murder against Christians, and became an apostle. Abraham quit civilization as he knew it and went off into the unknown, ending up being a father of many nations. Moses and David, they quit shepherding to be leaders of the people of Israel. Often, it is the quitters, the ones willing to change, who lead the way into the kingdom of heaven. As opposed to those that Jesus encounters in this morning's gospel I just read, who Jesus says refuse to turn from their sins. The church needs more strategic quitters. The kind of quitting that doesn't make us feel defeated or guilty. The kind of quitting that opens us up to feel emboldened. But let me start by putting this gospel lesson into context. It's Jesus' final days, what we call Holy Week. And the chief priests and the elders of the people, they are mad at him. 
In Matthew, this is the second time that Jesus enters the temple. And the first time, which was the day before, is, to say the least, a little bit memorable. The day before, he enters Jerusalem with all sorts of, of fanfare and people shouting, Son of David and ha, Hosanna. And then he goes right to the temple. He lets free all the animals, drives them out, overturns the money changers, tables, and disrupts the whole commerce, and then hangs around to heal many sick and lame people. And we're told by Matthew that these guys, seeing the amazing things he did, became angry. So they're waiting for him the next day, loaded for bear. They come right up to him, interrupting his teaching, and says, by what authority are you doing all these things, and who gave you that authority? I mean, this probably doesn't surprise us, does it? Their reaction to Jesus. It's pretty much institutional religion's default response. Whenever it feels threatened by the way it is, and that was true back then, it's, it's alas, still true today. It's a control issue. More important than the good things that were done is did you have permission to do them? And here it was, Jerusalem, a city swept up in messianic fervor that Jesus enters and and addresses the corrupt practices going on and makes people around him feel well, setting in motion, dramatically disrupting business as usual in the temple courts. It is a question of authority. Who said you could do that? Now, instead of answering that question, Jesus first takes the wind out of their sails by asking them about John the Baptist and the question they find they really can't answer honestly. And then he tells them a story. A certain man had two sons. Now these sons were polar opposites. You can tell by their response when their father asked them to do something. Go and work in my vineyard. The first son is disrespectful, dishonest, disobedient but he later changes his mind. The other son says he will do it, but then doesn't. And so it's a pretty straightforward account, basically words versus deeds, right? Jesus asked them, who, which son did the will of the father? And the answer is obvious, duh, the first one. And then he goes on to talk about tax collectors and prostitutes, and we lose him. But, but pay attention. He wants us to wrestle with that question Which son am I? And I know what I want to say. I want to say, I want to be the first son. I want to be the one doing the will of my Father in heaven. Well, I mean, actually, I'd like to be a son that says, yes, I'll go, and then goes out to work. But Jesus doesn't give us that option. Nor does he give us the option of a son who just says no, and then doesn't work and doesn't really care. No, but anyway, I have to admit that that first son is a lot like us a lot of the time. At first, we might be reluctant and hesitate, refuse for a whole bunch of reasons that may seem good at the time, but upon reflection, we we often repent of our rebellion and, and just go to work. Unfortunately, however, there are many times where we're like that second son, too. We talk a good game. We make promises, even have the best of intentions, but but chronically fail to deliver. We don't like to admit that. We just hope we'll be forgiven. That's what makes this a tricky passage. When Jesus turns the tables on the chief priests and elders who think they had nailed him in 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 an authority crisis, We kind of listen to that and smile, thinking it's all about them, and then boom, Jesus nails us. God the Father is asking us to go and work in his vineyard. But do we? Maybe we should first determine what working in the vineyard actually means. Because we probably just assume that Being a faithful son, working in this vineyard is is going to church Sunday mornings. 
But that's not work. That's the celebration part. That's where Christ calls us and sends us from. I mean, here are his words in Scripture. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to bring more workers out there. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The vineyard isn't in church. The vineyard is out there. It's the world. Now, ironically, COVID-19, with its isolation and required social distancing, has brought us to a unique challenge in this. We have had to quit church as we know it and actually get to work out there in the vineyard where we're already stuck and trapped, just as we're asked, out there to plant, to cultivate, to harvest. The thing is, we talk a good game. We know what we're called to do and where. But how often do we second sun it? We say we will. We even intend to do so, but we never quite get around to doing it. We need to quit whatever it is that's getting in our way. What, that, what might that be? We need to quit being afraid. Afraid of change, afraid of failure, afraid of leaving our comfort zones, afraid that other people might get mad at us, even hurt us. The chief priest and the elders were afraid to answer Jesus' question. They were the ones that were in charge. They were the ones people looked up to, and, and, and they decided to play it safe, maintain the status quo. They didn't have the guts to quit and answer the question. It was their authority that was called into doubt, and they realized right then and there it was lacking. So they said nothing. But we have nothing to fear, unless we don't get started. Like Paul says, or hopes in the epistle lesson, that on the day of Christ, may we be able to boast that we've never labored or run in vain. We also need to quit assuming that it's someone else's job. This gets back to the authority issue. But it's the Father who sends us out there. We don't need permission or, or special status to work in our Father's vineyard. Despite an early church that was made up entirely of untrained, run-of-the-mill lay people, despite Martin Luther's strong emphasis on a priesthood of all believers, we have become a church body that divides itself into two camps, pastors and everyone else. So, of course, we're prone to think all this evangelism stuff should be the work of trained experts. You got to take a class, get a special certificate, or at least a commission to be able to do it. That's not the way the church designed by Christ was meant to function. It's our job, all of us. And if we are ever happen to be challenged by the religious stuffed shirts, by what authority are you doing or saying this? The answer is clear. Christ's own authority. The first words of that great commission. He tells us, all authority in heaven and earth I give to you. <laughs> sure, it's a God-sized job. But he's given it to us. We also need to quit feeling that we're ill-equipped for the task. I mean, how many times I've heard people say, I don't know what to do or say in these circumstances. That's no excuse. I mean, let's say it was it wasn't a metaphor. And I, myself, was called out to go work into an actual vineyard. I'd be lost. I wouldn't know where to dig, what to cut or prune at first. I'd make mistakes. I'd need guidance. Trial and error would work for my benefit. But that's because that's just the at first 
part. Don't let early inadequacy cause you to be disobedient. That's the absolute coolest thing about the Holy Spirit. He's promised to gift us, to give us everything we need to accomplish what he wants us to do. He even says he'll give us the words to say. We, no matter who you are, no matter where you are situated right now, you have everything you need to be a fully functioning church of God. Right in you, right now. Marooned on a desert island, alone in a prison cell, just one of a hundred cubicles in a giant room. Everything you need to be at work in the fields of God, you already have. Just get to work, and you'll get it, and it'll get done. As I've uh, gotten older, I've discovered how true it is, that saying, that it's easier to act yourself into a new way of thinking then think yourself into a new way of acting. Going out and working in that field, mistakes and all, is only going to make you and me better at it. And it'll make us better children of God and make the, the vineyard a better place. So which son are we? I think a better question is, how much do we love our Father? the one who asks us to go out and work? Do we have a loving relationship with him? And what does that mean we're willing to give up to be obedient to what he asks? When it's put that way, saying, I quit, might be the first thing we have to say to a whole bunch of lesser things to respond to Jesus' call, follow me. Which means... Bob Goff is right, and Vince Lombardi is wrong. Strategic quitting will actually make winners of us all. May you quit to win. Amen. And now in the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. <laughs>
that they may know the peace and healing of your abiding presence. We pray for those who are ill, recovering from surgical treatments, battling addiction, struggling to make ends meet, dealing with displacement and loss, especially those we think of now whom we know personally. O oh Lord, may they experience your rebuilding strength through your love. We pray for this congregation that we may grow in faith and service and all be at work in your vineyard, wherever that may be, with intentionality and joy. We give you thanks for all the faithful departed who have confessed Christ as Lord, that we too may follow them in the paths of righteousness. All these things, O Lord, and whatever else you see that we need, we ask that you grant us, for your mercy is everlasting and your faithfulness endures from age to age. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now in the words that Christ has taught us, we're bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord God Almighty order our days and our deeds in his peace and clothe us with righteousness as we leave this place of celebration and get out to work in the vineyards of our Father. May he equip you with every good work so to do. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, that's our worship for this morning. Thank you for being a part of us wherever you may be. We ask that God blesses you and that you do find yourselves at work in his vineyard. A um, couple of things that are really neat and new happening. Uh, this week we had the groundbreaking for the section of our property which we handed over to Habitat for Humanity. They're going to start construction on nine houses of which we can actually help be a part of building and welcoming these new people, our literal neighbors. So there's, there's a video on Habitat for Humanity Northwest so you can watch. They had a virtual event of doing that. Um, we are still gathering in worship. The limit we can have in this place is 35 at the present time, and the numbers are going up when they should be going down in our county. So we'll probably be staying that. You have to phone the office and make a reservation. Um, if the 9 o'clock service fills up, the 11, we'll start an 11 o'clock service with regard to that. Um, regular things going on. Offices open from 9 to 1 every weekday. We got Bible studies going on. Um, the 1 o'clock, for the uh, Wednesday at 10 p.m. and all this, and we have Samaritan, good um, Operation Christian Child, Samaritan's Purse. We got plenty of boxes of these to give away, and, and, and if there's a video going on after this, this is really cool too to help us be a part for the, uh, for I think the 11th, 12th straight year. So thank you. God bless you, and be a blessing to others. Three. Count of three when children open the shoe boxes, they're so excited. I mean, it's just been incredible. Kids are so excited, giving them a gift, do it in Jesus' name, and that's what this is all about. Jesus loves you. It's a gospel opportunity. It's the chance for the children to change the entire life. The word of God is spreading. The gospel is advancing. It is impacting children. It is impacting families. It is impacting the world greatly. Thank you for praying. Thank you for giving. God will bless, and God will use your gift to touch the life of a child and to be able to do it in Jesus' name. So thank you. Thank you for being a part of it. God bless each and every one of you. Thank you, Michael.
we are so appreciative of all that your parents did for the greater Clark County community and all that you continue to do honoring their legacy through the Ed and Dolly Lynch Fund and Community Foundation of Southwest Washington. We can't think of another couple more deserving of this honor than Ray and Harriet Johnson. Ray and Harriet have been with Habitat since 1991 when we first started as board members, as volunteers, as committee members. They've worn so many hats I can't keep track of all, including hard hats. In fact, I don't think Ray is ever going to fully retire from Habitat as he's still doing donation pickups in his pickup for the Habitat Restore. We're here today at the future home of the Johnson Village property. We're so excited today. We wish all of you could be here with us to help bless this land and break ground. But we're happy that we can bring it to you today as part of this Raising the Roof event. We're so excited for these nine homes that will be uh, a place of safety and solitude and security uh, and be affordable for nine future families here. So I want to introduce Ray and Harriet Johnson because they're just such amazing people and we're so happy they could be with here, be with us here today and, and help us bless this day. Ray and Harriet, would you like to say a few words? Harriet and I have been blessed so much over the years and have been able just to be able to donate to, to do all the things that we did for Habitat and we'll continue as long as we live. Thank you. Get one shovel here. You want to come there? Yes. Well come on then. We'll do that part in just a minute, Ray. <laughs> okay. Before we, we get to breaking grounds, I want to make sure we have an opportunity. You know, Habitat was founded as a Christian organization, remains so, with our roots with Koinia Farms in the Americus, Georgia area. Uh, so it's important to us that we start this land off with a blessing. So we've been fortunate to work with Good Shepherd Lutheran Church here in Vancouver to purchase this land. And couldn't think of anybody better than to have them come out and help us bless us today. So please welcome Pastor Ted Fuller to help us with that. Let us pray. Lord God of heaven and earth, the whole world cannot contain you. You are everywhere and anywhere your people are. And yet you realize that place is important to your children. So we ask you, O oh Lord, as we dedicate this property to you, that you bless it with your presence. May it be a promised land for families that are wandering through the wilderness of home poverty. May it be holy ground, not that we take off our shoes, but we roll up our sleeves and work together to fashion houses that become homes. Bless this place. We give you thanks for Habitat, its, its wonderful supporters and volunteers, that you may equip them with all that is needed to make nine homes in this area. That we may look down like Jacob before us and say, truly, God is in this place. Bless us, O Lord, and this site to your glory. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Shall we break some ground? Yes. Okay. 